Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it this night, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We thank you that we're ready to take hold of it, be hearers and doers of it, and it will bring forth much fruit. We thank you for all that you accomplished this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. This morning we begin a new series on the subject of our Heavenly Father. And we took the time to talk about who the Father is, pointing out many aspects of His character and what He is described as. We also saw the preeminence of the Father in the Godhead. We also saw what the Father will do. Many things that spoke of what the Father will do and what He wants to accomplish in our lives. Tonight we're going to move on and we're going to talk about what believers are to do to know and to have fellowship with the Father and see His work be accomplished in our life, which is very important. We begin in Ephesians 1, 3 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings on heavenly places in Christ. We've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings because we're in covenant relationship. They've already been given to us. They belong to us. All the promises of God are ours. Now, we are to possess them and we're to walk in the ways of the Lord. And if we're going to do this, we talked about many things, how there's conditions for seeing the promises of God come to pass, and we need to meet the conditions and see God bring forth what He purposes. We mentioned in Matthew, there were many cases where it spoke about our Heavenly Father, Heavenly and Father together, 22 times, the most times. All the rest of them were just a small number, where it really brings a lot of revelation about Him from our standpoint of be in our Heavenly Father. We're going to begin in Matthew and begin to go through the New Testament, looking at scriptures that describe what you and I are to do to know the Father and to have fellowship with Him and to see His blessings and the results that He wants to bring forth in our life. In Matthew chapter 4, in the temptation, Jesus made this statement. He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And this is talking about out of, mouth, out of the mouth of God, the Father. Remember, the Godhead is involved in all these things. We talked about many things this morning that are important to understand. I hope you can listen to that if you haven't heard that message yet. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, we're to live by that means if you're going to be in fellowship with the Lord and you're going to see Him accomplish things, the Father accomplish things, we have to live by the Word. We must live by the Word. The Word is what needs to be foot, put first place in our life. We see further in verse 7, Jesus said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. <clears throat> we don't tempt Him to try to get Him to do something that would be contrary to what His Word says. We do the Word. We're responsible to carry out the things He says and to see Him accomplish His promises, all the things that He purposes in our life. We see in verse 10, Then said Jesus to him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. If you and I are going to see God move mightily and see the Father accomplish what He purposes, we're to worship Him. We talked about that this morning, how we're to worship the Father now in spirit and in truth. Here he speaks of worshiping the Lord thy God. That's the, talking about the Heavenly Father. And Him only shalt thou serve. God wants you to worship Him. As you worship Him and minister to Him, He'll minister back unto you. It'll bring a filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. And you're to serve Him. This is why we must live unto Him and not unto ourselves. In Matthew chapter 5, we see in verse 8, <clears throat> Blessed are the pure in heart. Those that are pure in heart are clean in heart. God wants us to have a clean heart. That means He wants to get everything out of our heart that's not of the Lord. We need to guard our hearts so we don't have any evil things coming into our heart. Remember, we can have all kinds of evil in our heart. Even though we got a brand new heart at the new birth and we got a new spirit as well, we still can have evil in our heart. We can have doubt in our heart. We can have... Um, 
unbelief in our heart, we can have all kinds of things. Blessed are the pure, the clean in heart, for they shall see God. God wants you to have a perfect heart. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to have be cleansed of every evil thing out of your life so that your heart is totally right with the Lord. We see in verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, it says the children of God, but this word means sons. This is the word huios. You see below, if you're here for the first time, we put up information. When I put a cursor over a word, it pops up in the lower window, the Strong's number, which is what this is, and the Greek word and information that we point out. And this talks about son, not children. For they shall be called the sons of God. The ones that aren't a peacemaker, they're not going to be called the sons of God. We are to be showing ourselves that we're walking in the ways of the Lord to be the sons of God, and then God will manifest himself unto us as we are doing what he says. Peacemakers. God wants you to be a peacemaker. Don't be one that gets in strife. Don't be one that's argumentative. Don't be one that's doing things that are contrary to making the way of peace. We see in verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God wants you to let your light shine. We don't hide it under a bushel. We let our light shine. We live unto the Lord as we do the word. And notice, the way it's going to be shown forth is by your good works, the things you do. Your works show forth your walk. He thinks people to see the good works and they'll glorify your Father which is in heaven because you are to walk in the ways of the Lord and your light is to shine. We also see in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. This is where Jesus is bringing forth the changes from the Old Testament to the New Testament in the Sermon on the Mount. We see in just in this verse, this, this, these two verses, where he speaks in verse 43, you've heard that it's been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's the Old Testament. Are we under the Old Testament? No, we're under the New Testament. Do we live according to the Old Testament? No, we live according to the New Testament now. There's a change, and Jesus is revealing the change. But I say unto you, he's saying, this is now the law of Christ. This is now the law of the New Testament that I am speaking for, that he was going to bring into manifestation. But I say unto you, love your enemies. No, oh, we don't, we're not supposed to hate our enemy anymore. We're supposed to love our enemies now. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. No retaliation? Never. Instead, we give people what they have need of, not what they deserve. We're not going to be a judge. If you're a judge, you're going to be judged. You need to give out what people have need of. They need love. They need blessing. They need you doing good to them, they need you praying for them. As you do these things, and these are all commands that God has given us. When he says, love your enemies, every one of these are imperative mood verbs. There's tense voice and mood in verbs. And here, here also it's in the present tense, which means continuous ongoing action. So this is a command to continually always be loving your enemies. Same thing with blessing. You are to be blessing, command, imperative mood, present tense. You're to be continually blessing those that might curse you. You're to be doing good to them. Again, every one of these are talking about this, doing the good here. When you do these things, you're commanded to do it, present tense, imperative mood. Same thing with praying for people. You are to pray for people. You are commanded to do this those that despitefully use you and persecute you. Never retaliate. Never get any kind of attitudes against them. Instead, you always walk in forgiveness. You always walk in love. You always walk, and then you bless. You speak forth the word of God. You speak forth what God wants you to speak. And then he goes on and says, this is the New Testament way, see, the law of Christ. What's going to be the result? That you may be the sons again, huios, 
the sons of your Father which is in heaven. You say, well, I thought I was a son just because I got born again. Well, you've got the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You've been, now the Spirit of His Son has come into us, but that doesn't make you sons in reality as far as in relationship with the Father. It's done by what you do. That's why He says, you do these things that you may be sons of your Father. Otherwise, if you're not doing what the Word says, are you going to be sons of the Father? No, you could be just like, you could be like the devil. You could be walking like the world. You could be doing all kinds of things. He wants you to show forth you are sons of the Father because you do walk in love and bless and do good and pray for others. He makes the sun to rise on the evil, on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He goes on and says, if you love them that love you, Otherwise, oh, I would love people that love me. They're, that's easy. What reward have you? There is no reward for that. Even the publican's the same. The world does these kind of things. If you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? And we're not doing anything different. Do not even the publicans so. Then he says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. It's not a good translation in the King James. The reason is because the word be here, you would think that's a command, but it is not a command. It is a future tense statement in the Greek. What it says literally is what Young's, this is Young's literal translation, best New Testament that I know of, or Bible totally that is out there. He translated things accurately. You shall therefore be perfect is what it's saying as your Father who is in the heavens is perfect. Otherwise, if you do these things, if you're loving your enemies, blessing those that curse you, doing good, praying for them, and you're, you know, you're saluting people, regardless of what, what they, how they treat you, that declares you shall be perfect, even as your Father is perfect. And you and I are to be perfect. We are to go on into perfection in the Lord. You and I are to come to that place of being like the Father. God wants to manifest Himself in you, and the Father will manifest Himself as you are doing the things of the Word of God. We see in Matthew chapter 6, Take heed that you do not your alms, giving out uh, mercy gifts to people, before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, uh, well, I want people to recognize what I'm doing. No, that's, that's wrong attitude. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven because your motivation is to get someone to look at you and think that you've done some great thing. That's not what you do. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, Thy, thy, thy alms, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. This is talking about motivation. Your motivation must be that you are doing things unto the Lord not to be seen by men. You're doing it in obedience to Him. That's not saying that people might see you doing something, but your motivation is not to be doing it unto men. And this is true in more things as you will see. He says here in verse 5, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues, in the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men, thinking that they're spiritual, you know, super spiritual people. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter in thy closet, and thou shut the door, pray to the Father in secret. The Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, does this mean that we don't pray openly? No, we should pray openly. They did it in the New Testament. They did it in the book of Acts. This is talking about motivation. If you are praying for everybody to see that you're doing something, then you have no reward. But if you are praying with the right attitude of heart, that you are praying in obedience to what God wants, and you're not doing anything to try to get someone to think anything special about you, you are going to be rewarded. Notice it says he will reward you openly. The same thing is true about fasting when we come down to verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. 
Otherwise, if you're fasting, did you look all bedraggled and like, oh, you know, I'm, look at me, I'm fasting, you know. Verily I say unto they have their reward. No, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, clean up, look normal, you know, just like you would any other time. But thou appear not unto men to fast. You're not trying to think, teach men, appear to men that you're fasting. But unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Again, this is motivation. Now, some people get off track on this and they think, well, I can't tell anybody that I'm fasting. I can't even tell my wife. Well, she's going to fix a nice dinner and you're not going to eat it, huh? No, it's ridiculous. Of course you communicate to them. It's talking about motivation of hearts, not like you can't say something. No. Your motivation must be you're doing everything unto the Lord. When you do that, then you will be rewarded by the Lord. Right motivation. Also, going back to when we pray, Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, when you pray, Use not vain repetitions. When it talks about vain repetitions, this particular Greek word here is a word which, <clears throat> you look it up in the lexicons, Freiburg's lexicon, Laonida's lexicon, means to use many meaningless words. The reason why that's talking about that is because we do pray without ceasing, and we do pray continuously, but we pray meaningful words, things that are in line with the word. But don't just be praying a bunch of meaningless words just babbling on that don't have any meaning whatsoever, thinking you're going to be heard, says the heathen do. They think they should be heard for their much speaking. If they just keep on speaking, that God will respond. No, he's not going to respond because you're much speaking. He's only going to respond when you pray accurate New Testament prayer in line with the word. Now, when he tells you that you might not use these vain repetitions, well, you know, again, this, this again doesn't mean that you don't speak continually in prayer, which we'll, we'll see that in a little bit. Be not therefore like unto him, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. And we'll be covering this in a minute. You're praying to the Father, and this is the word iteo, which means a demand of what's due you. That's what you are praying for, to release the promises to come into manifestation in your life. And so we come to verse 9, and it tells us of how we're to pray. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, will be done as it is in heaven. <clears throat> give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Unfortunately, People have just prayed this like it's some prayer I'm just supposed to pray, just recite that thing. No, it's teaching you how you pray. After this manner, it's teaching you how you pray because of everything that's brought forth here. Our Father, we pray to our Father now. Where is he in heaven? Hallowed be thy name. Now, in the New Testament, we pray in the name of Jesus. And when we pray... We're going to pray commands to see things come into manifestation. When it says your kingdom come, it's significant to look at these verbs. The verb, it's not just making a nice statement. Oh, your kingdom comes. No. The word come is an imperative mood statement. Imperative mood is a command. Otherwise, you are saying the command, come, kingdom your kingdom, come. You're commanding the kingdom to come into manifestation. Thy will come to pass or come into being. This is the word ginomai. This is again an imperative mood, which means a command. We're not just making a reciting a statement. We're actually commanding these things to come into being. And then he goes on and says, give us this day our daily bread. Same thing. This is also a command. Every one of these are commands. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This one also is an imperative mood for a command. Why? Because these are our rights as sons if we meet the conditions that he will do these things. We'll cover this in a minute. 
Notice, as we forgive, well, that is depending upon whether we do it. This is simply a statement of fact as we forgive our debtors. It wouldn't be a command. Otherwise, we are to carry this out and forgive. Then it comes to lead us not into temptation. And we're going to come back to this in a little bit. But this leading us not into temptation is a subjunctive mood verb which is expressing something that is a conditional statement based on if you meet the conditions. It's not a statement of fact. It's not a command. The indicative mood, which is one of the mood before, uh, was just a, like it says about how you, you, you forgive, it is a statement of fact. This is a statement that is not a statement of fact, but it is conditional upon conditions being met. And we'll cover that in a little bit. And then he says, deliver us from evil. And now this is back to a command. We are making commanding statements. Now why are we doing this? We'll come back to this in a minute. But we're going to go over to John. In John chapter 16, one of the things that's critical, if you're going to see God accomplish things in your life, you have to learn how to pray accurate New Testament prayer. And let me say this for you who have not heard this before. It is totally different from Old Testament prayer. There is a change from Old Testament prayer to New Testament prayer. In the Old Testament, they would ask, they would request, they would petition to see if God would do something. That's not the way we pray in the New Testament. Look what we says here in John 16, 23. Jesus doing the speaking. In that day, talking about the day of the New Testament when it comes into force, you shall ask me nothing. That means we don't pray to Jesus. All prayers to Jesus are contrary to the Word of God. Jesus said it out of his own mouth. You shall ask me nothing. So why are people praying to Jesus? It's a mistake. You look through the New Testament, they always pray to the Father, not to Jesus. Always. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father, now we pray to the Father, in my name. What is Je where is Jesus? He's at the right hand of the Father. What is his function now? He is the one who is the Lord over the church, the high priest of the covenant, and he's the one who takes what we pray and presents it before the Father, and he also will speak it before the angels as well. Now we pray directly to the Father because we have come into relationship with the Father by being born again. And we pray in His name, bringing in His high priestly ministry into operation. Now, it says when you pray to the Father in my name, He'll give it to you. So who's going to give it to you? Not Jesus. The Father is going to give it to you. Next, when we put the cursor over these words, the word ask. The word ask in the Greek for this word is erateo, number 2065. You'll see me show you something in a moment about this. This means really to request or request as a favor. You would think now that, well, the next word must be erateo too because it must be the same word since it's translated ask, but it's not. You have to look up every word. You put the cursor over the next word. This is a word number 154, iteo. It is a different word. And here are the meanings of what these words mean. This is Strong's Concordance reproduced in the Lightning Bible program. Remember the first one was number 2065, about how you ask me nothing? It means properly a request as a favor. You don't request as a favor of Jesus of anything. He said so out of his own mouth. Then what are we supposed to do? We're now to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And how do we approach him? Number 154. Strictly a demand of something due. We are going to make a demand of something due us of the Father in the name of Jesus when we pray. Why is that? Because in the New Testament, 
All the promises of God have already been given to us. All the promises are yea and in him, amen. And we, as we saw the first scripture, we've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. All the promises have already been given to us. This is why you see Jesus and Paul also praying. They would always start off with thanksgiving. Why? Because it's already been given to them. I wouldn't thank someone for something unless it was already given to me. If it wasn't given to me, I'd ask him, see, hey, will you give it to me? But if he's already given it to me, I would be saying thanks as I'm taking hold of it. That's New Testament prayer. You always pray with thanksgiving. But also because the promises have already been given to you, you already have them as your inherited rights as a son. You're a son and heir of God. Therefore, you are bringing forth what the scripture promise says and according to the covenant, you're making a demand upon that covenant for that promise that's been given to you to come into manifestation. Otherwise, you're really making a legal demand of what is due you. I learned about this even before uh, I knew anything about the Greek long ago because I was a claims adjuster for five years before God called me into the ministry. And we would, what was called subrogation, recover monies from people who owed us. And when we wrote letters to recover these monies, we would write, we request for you to send us the money that you owe us and present the documentation and so forth. Well, the home office wrote a letter to one day to everybody in the entire country and said, stop requesting. When you write a letter, you say, I demand that you, rec get rec that you send the money that, I, that you owe me. It legally belongs to you. Now, why was that? because that was according to law, making a legal demand of what is due us. When I saw this and understood this, I understood it right away because I did it for several years. Whatsoever you shall make a legal demand of what's due you of the Father, a spiritual demand of what's due you of the Father in my name, he will give it you. And the reason we're doing it is because the promises have already been given to you. And how do you make a demand of what's due you? you bring the scripture promise that already belongs to you and present that. Just like the attorney presents the law to the judge that he's representing his client, here's what the law says in order to see that law be enforced. So you are going to bring the spiritual laws that have already been given to you, the promises, before the Father in the name of Jesus. He will give it you. Hitherto, which means up to this time, have you, Iteo, made a demand to what's due you of nothing in my name. Why is that? Because the New Testament wasn't enforced. See, Jesus is teaching New Testament prayer. He's te he taught all things about New Testament, all the changes that were coming. He said, make, Iteo, make a demand to what's due you. And when he says this, this wasn't like a good idea, a good suggestion. Because when you look up the word Iteo, it is an imperative mood statement, meaning you are to make a demand of what's due. You're commanded to make a demand of what's due you. That's how you pray in the New Testament. And you shall receive. Now that brings us to another point. The word receive, many people think of receiving as, yeah, I'm ready for it to come to me. They're ready to accept what's coming to them. That would be like a passive reception, like I throw the ball to you and you catch what comes to you, you receive it. There's also another Greek word, though, that's, that's the word dekamai. There's another Greek word, lambano, and it means the opposite. It means a self-prompted taking hold of, which is an active reception. I take hold of it as opposed to waiting for it to come to me. The word in here and in all the prayer, prayer scriptures, they're all iteo and lambano, which means a taking hold of. This is the way you pray in the New Testament. He said, up to this time, you've made no de demand of what's due you of anything in my name. Make a demand of what's due you and you shall take hold of it, that your joy may be full. What am I doing when I'm taking hold of it? That's your faith 
receiving, taking hold of that promise and speaking it into being so it comes into manifestation in your life. And you do it with thanksgiving because it's already been given to you. This is why you see Jesus praying. Father, I thank you. Why did he do that? Because he was already, you know, he, he already knew the things he was praying were what the will of the Father was. And so he was thanking him as he was speaking those things forth. You and I do the same thing. So now, we now are to pray, making demands of what's due us. In fact, it's interesting. Verse 26 says, At that day, the day of the New Testament, you shall, I tell, make a demand of what's due you in my name. And then Jesus says, I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. He's not going to pray the Father for you. Many people say, well, I want Jesus to pray the Father for me so something will happen. No, you're going to pray the Father for you. He's not going to pray the Father for you. You are going to do it. In the name of Jesus, which puts his high priestly ministry in operation, but you're going to be praying directly to the Father in the name of Jesus. In all the major prayer scriptures throughout the New Testament, it's always praying to the Father in the name of Jesus, I tell, making a demand of what's due you, Lombano, taking hold of it to speak it into being. We'll show you some other scriptures along this line. Matthew 21, 22. This is a scripture, again, highly misunderstood. All things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you should receive. People have thought of it this way. I'm going to ask, make my request in prayer. Believing, I'm going to make sure I'm really believing, I'm going to get it. You shall get it. That's not what it says at all. First of all, the all things it's talking about are all the things that are yours, which are all the promises of God. Whatsoever you, I tell you, make a demand of what's due you in prayer, which is how you pray, believing, what do you do when you're believing? You're going to do something. I believe, so what am I going to do? Because I believe, I'm going to lombano it. You shall take hold of it to bring it into manifestation. This is what the prayer of faith is. Many people do not understand the prayer of faith whatsoever because they never looked these things up and understood this. Mark 11, 24. Familiar scripture to people all over the world, pretty much. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire. Now, most people thought desire. Oh, that's whatever I want. Well, you've got to look up words. Is this the word for desire? No, it's the word aiteo, number 154, translated ask in most of the places, but here translated desire for some ridiculous reason. Who knows why they did it? It's not talking about what you desire or what you want. And this has been a catch-all one. Oh, if I, whatever I desire, oh, I desire this, so I'm going to pray and believe I receive it, and it's going to happen for me. <laughs> no. What things, whoever you make a demand to what's due you, which means you've got to have a scripture promise for it. If you don't have chapter and verse, forget it. It's not going to happen. When you pray, believe, and the word believe here is a command. It's not like I'm going to try my best. You are commanded imperative mood, continually to believe that you, Lombano, take hold of it. Another thing that's significant is that when you pray, you don't pray just one time. One of the things we've seen in the body of Christ that's a major problem, there has been the teaching that has gone forth that says faith is released one time. You pray one time. You speak to the mountain one time. You cast out one time, these kind of things. Thinking that if I commanded, or if I prayed, or if I spoke to that mountain one time, I release my faith. And should, why would I need to do, do it again? If I did it again, I must not have believed the first time what I said. That's the rationale in their mind. But they fail to understand that is error thinking. First of all, your faith is not released just once. It is released at any point in time when you're speaking things into being. For instance, when we're casting out demons, we command the demon to come out. Our faith was released with the authority and power to work. Well, maybe it didn't come out right away. 
What do we do? We keep commanding until it starts coming out. In other words, we keep, our, uh, keep speaking, putting our faith in operation, power through our faith and authority released and released and released until we see results. It's the same thing in all the things we do in prayer. You pray without ceasing. And that we can prove it from this verse because when I put the word, cursor of the word desire, which is iteo, a demand to what's due, you remember, it is a present tense verb. The present tense means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. So does that mean I'm going to do this just once? No. I'm going to do it continuously. Furthermore, this is the middle voice. Tense, voice, and mood are important. There are three voices in the Greek. And if you're here for the first time or you haven't heard me talk much about some of these things, you'll learn. Just hold on. Don't check out. <laughs> it's important to know this. You've got to know this. The voices, there's active voice, meaning the subject is doing the action. There's passive voice, meaning the subject is being acted upon by someone else. When it's the middle voice, as it is here, it means the subject is doing the action for his benefit, to benefit him for results in his own life. This tells you that you are making a demand to what's due you for your benefit to see that promise come into manifestation in your life. What the things, soever you make a demand to what's due you continuously, how about the word pray? The word pray is also a present tense, ongoing action. How about the word believe, which was a command? Um, you didn't notice it before, it also was present tense. How about the word receive, lambano? Is that a one-time thing? No. You do it continuously. Other words, you continually release your faith and keep speaking the things forth until the manifestation comes. You pray without ceasing. All the major prayer scriptures are like this. We'll show you another one. First John, chapter three, verse twenty-two. Whatsoever we I tell, make a demand to what's due us. We, lambano of him. And this tells you there's some conditions also that could mess up your prayer from working because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing his sight. If you're walking in sin, are your demand to what's due you and taking hold of going to work? No, it's going nowhere. You've got to be keeping his commandments and doing the things that are pleasing in his sight. When it talks about this making a demand to what's due, it's a present tense verb. And it also is talking about how this is a subjunctive mood verb in the fact that it's a conditional statement because it's not saying whatsoever you make a demand of him, you take hold of him, it's going to automatically happen because it's a conditional statement. Why would it be a conditional statement here? Because it gave you the conditions right down here. Keep his commandments and do the things pleasing in his sight. If you don't meet the conditions, forget it. It's not going to happen. That's why it's in a subjunctive mood there, to take hold of these things. So that's why you take and make a demand of what's due you, and then you take hold of it of him, present tense. God wants us to understand these things. I can show you one other, this is not our subject totally, but this is certainly important. This is another scripture that's important for you to understand. 1 John 5, verse 14. As I said, there's a change from Old Testament prayer to New Testament prayer. And now we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We bring the scripture promise, what it's written, what it says. And then we take hold, believe we take hold of it with thanksgiving to bring it into manifestation. That means we don't repetition, we don't request, so, well, uh, there's some words in the Bible about that. Yeah, there are. In fact, we'll show you one of them. We'll go back to this in a moment. Just to help some of you that have not heard this, Philippians 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. You always start out with thanksgiving, accompanying your prayer. Let your requests, there's the request. What's the word request? It's number 155, which is simply a form of Ateo, it's a word, itema. It's just the, the noun form of it. 
but it's the same word, Iteo. Just 155 right next to 154. You make your demands of what's due you be made known unto God. We go back to 1 John chapter 5 to show you New Testament prayer. And all the prayer scriptures, all of them, are all Iteo and Lombano. Look what it says here. And this is what we're to understand. We're to have absolute confidence when we pray. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask, make a demand of what's due us, I tell you, of anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hears us, whatsoever we made a demand of what's due us, I tell you, we know that we have the Oh, there's a petitions. Itema, the noun form of Iteo, which is the legal demands that we Iteoed of him, not desired, but made a demand of what's due us of him. Oh, they really made a mess of that when they translated it. It's not even close. Furthermore, when it says you make a demand of anything, how do I, what do I make a demand of? It's got to be in line with the Word because it's got to be according to the will, which is the Word of God. If you don't have chapter and verse, it's, you're going nowhere. And then it says, He heareth us. He is hearing us. Otherwise, does He automatically hear everything? No. Remember, the guy who does evil, he's not going to hear his prayers. If you don't keep the commandments and do things pleasing his sight, he's not going to hear the prayers. He doesn't automatically hear things. He hears the things that you bring in line with the word, in line with the covenant promises that have been given unto you. We'll come back there in a moment just to help you on this. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. Well, See, he hears all of our prayers. No, it doesn't say that. It's talking about the righteous. And the one who's righteous is one who's not just born again, but doing righteousness. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Could you be born again do evil? Sure you could. Is the face of the Lord against you? Yeah. Is he hearing your prayers? No. Didn't meet the conditions. 1 John 5, verse 14. This is the confidence, and he wants you to have this confidence that we are having in him, that if we are making a demand of anything according to his will, whatever scripture promise you have, he is hearing us. And if we know that he is hearing us, again, this is the present tense for the hearing here, Whatsoever we made a demand of what's due us, we know that we are having, again, present tense for having, the, the legal demands that we made a legal demand of him. That's literally what it says. It's a tremendous prayer scripture when you understand what it says. And this is what we're, we're supposed to have absolute confidence. We should have our prayers answered all the time if we're praying right and we understand what we're doing. Because God's not holding anything back. All the promises are given to us. He wants these things to come into manifestation. So this is essentially saying, this is the confidence that we have in Him. If we make a legal demand of anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He heareth us whatsoever, we made a legal demand of what was due us. We know that we have the legal demands that we made a legal demand that were due us of Him. That's New Testament prayer. That is how we are to pray. And if you're going to see the Father manifest and give you the promises, we've got to come in line with the Scriptures. Now, I'm going to show you another Scripture. And we, this is in the song that we sang tonight about making your mouth work for you. Isaiah 45, verse 11. The last part of this verse says, Concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. You and I are to command the things of God to come into manifestation. This is why when we go back to Matthew, when we were seeing all these things, Matthew 6, verse 9 and following, when it said, thy kingdom come, 
Remember, this was imperative. Come, thy kingdom. Be done. Come to pass thy will on earth. Be, come to pass on earth, will, your will, as it is in heaven. You're commanding these things into being. These are commands. And then, give us this day our daily bread. These are commands. Now, so what are we doing? Commanding God. We're not commanding God to make him do something. All you, what you're doing, you're commanding God to release what he's already given to you to come into manifestation according to spiritual law because everything operates according to law in the spirit, the laws of the spirit. So you're just simply functioning according to spiritual law and speaking these things into being, making commands. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We're meeting the conditions. And also about delivering us from evil, the delivering us part. What about this temptation thing? When it says, lead us not into temptation. Well, number one, you've got to understand about temptation. There are two different types of temptation. There's temptation by the devil, and there's also temptation by God. Temptation by the devil is designed to steal, kill, and destroy, take the word out of you, and, and get you into sin so he can do a destructive work against you. Does God tempt with evil? Never. James 1.13, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. This is people say, see, well, God can can't tempt anybody because this scripture says I'm not tempted of God. But you have to understand what it's talking about, about being tempted of God, or how. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth the any man, and the implication is with evil. Otherwise, you're not going to tempt him with evil. But does God tempt us? Yes, he does. With what? With his word to see if we're going to do it or not. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Look what it says. It came to pass after these things. God did tempt Abraham. What was he doing? He was testing him to find out whether or not he was going to do what needed to be done. And he told him to take his son, remember, and offer him up as there on Mount Moriah. And he obeyed. And he was ready to slay the son with a knife up. And then God said, now I know that you fear, the, fear me. The angel set out of heaven. And he's told him, of course, not to slay his son. And he provided himself a lamb, which is all pointing towards Jesus, the lamb, who was going to be the one who was going to pay the price for the sins of mankind. But because he was willing to do that, then he was receiving Jesus in a figure as being raised from the dead because God had already told him that he was going to, in his seed, his blessings were going to be in his seed, and that meant his seed had to live. That meant if he killed him, he'd have, he was counting that God would raise him from the dead. Talks about that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19. So he tempted. God tests or tempts with his word for what purpose? To see whether or not you're going to do it or not. Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee. This is the same word, to test or tempt or try you. To know what's in your heart, whether you keep the commandments or not. Why would God have to test you? He needs to find out what's in your heart and whether you'll keep the commandments or not. That's one of the reasons. We see another case in Deuteronomy 13, verse 3. You shall not hearken to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. He's testing you, trying you, tempting you. Same word, to know whether you love the Lord. Do you really love him or not? Here's another scripture that uses the same word. Exodus 16, verse 4. Then said the Lord to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them or test them whether they're going to walk in my law or not. Otherwise, God is going to test you with his word to find out, are you going to do it or not? Are you going to walk in it or not? 
and that's important. We see one other case. It's over in Second Chronicles, chapter 32. This is talking about Hezekiah, verse 31. And this is where Hezekiah, all the things he was doing, the Babylonians came and said, the ambassadors of the prince of Babylonia sent unto him to inquire the wonder that was done in the land, things that were accomplished. They wanted to find out what happened. And God left him, he let him alone, to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. God isn't necessarily always going to tell you everything. In this case, he left him to find out whether what was in his heart, whether he was going to do what was right or not. So these are instances where we see God tempting or testing. And what's the purpose? Well, we, we, we see in these ones, as so we go back to this, where it says, lead us not into temptation. He's making a statement here. What would cause the Father to tempt or test someone if he sees your heart isn't right? Or if he sees you're not keeping his commands? Or you haven't been walking in the Word? Or you haven't been obedient? You know, you haven't been doing these things? Because that's the purpose of his testing, to find things out. And so he's saying, lead us not into temptation, otherwise we might not, subjunctive mood, the way you translate this, you might not lead us, that you might not lead us into temptation. Conditional. Meaning, if we've met your conditions, don't lead us into testing us. And if you and I, how, how would we meet his conditions? If you and I are having a heart that's right, if we are keeping his commands, if we are loving the Lord with all of our heart and mind, if we are walking in the word, then he sees because by our works and he wouldn't do that. But this is very interesting why this is in here. Otherwise, he may lead you into temptation to see if you're right before the Lord because remember, if you're not keeping his commandments and do those things pleasing in your sight, can you, take, can you take hold of anything you make a demand of what's due us? No, remember, that was a conditional statement. If you haven't met the conditions. So that's why this is in here. So the way this is speaking of in this verse, is we pray to the Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, and we pray commands, speaking commands to bring the things that God purposes into manifestation. Come, your kingdom, be done your will. Give, give this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The kingdom is the rule and the reign of God. The power is his power being manifest and the, glory, and the, the power of God going operation through the word and the glory is the manifest presence of God. That is what will happen when you and I pray accurate New Testament prayer. It'll bring God's rule and reign, that's the kingdom. It'll release the power of God in operation, and it will bring the manifestation of the glory of God and see all these things come to pass. So what this is essentially saying, he's saying you're now supposed to pray accurate New Testament prayer to the Father in the name of Jesus, make a legal demand of what's due you, of all the promises that belong to you. With thanksgiving, you take hold of them, and also you command the work of his hands, the kingdom rule of God to come forth with power and glory and all these for his deliverance to come forth and him to perform his word on whatever it is, including forgiving you or whatever it might be, or giving you your daily bread. He wants these things for you. That is how you pray New Testament prayer. Most people have no earthly idea. They just pray whatever they want to pray. And no wonder they don't see anything happen. By the way, Jesus wouldn't do a lot of times what they did, what they wanted to do, because he didn't come to do what they wanted to do. He came to speak what the Father wanted. Here's an example in Luke's account about this. In verse chapter 11, verse 1, 
It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Is Jesus going to teach how the John taught his disciples? No way. So he just says, he said to him, when you pray, say, he's teaching New Testament prayer, isn't he? Praying to the Father. John didn't teach that one. He didn't preach. He didn't teach him to say, come with commands. Same thing, thy kingdom. No, he didn't teach that stuff at all. In other words, Jesus was teaching New Testament prayer, and that's what we want to see. God wants us to see all these things. In fact, all the good things that God the Father brings forth, you've got to learn how to pray accurate New Testament prayer. Look what it says here, the same thing. This word, I tell you, you do a word search on that, number 154 through the entire New Testament, you're going to see all the demands that were made all over the place in prayer and the things that you're supposed to speak and make a legal demand of what's due you to bring forth promises into manifestation. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. If you then be an evil, well, how to give good gifts unto your children, how much shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, give good things? He'll give good things. To who? To them that do what? I tell, make a demand to what's due them. Not to the guy who asks petitions and requests. That's Old Testament prayer. Now, if you have never heard this before, you may have to kind of work this through your mind because you may have been used to requesting, petitioning, asking, and all this stuff because everybody's taught it, because they haven't looked up the words, unfortunately, and they've been doing Old Testament prayer, which is a mistake. No, we bring the promises of God and take hold of these things. That is what God wants. Now, as we move on about things that the Father wants us to do in order to have fellowship with Him and to see Him accomplish things in our life. Everything's based on the covenant relationship that we have with Him. He is a performer of His Word. Matthew 6, 14, if you forgive men their trespasses, that means, you, this is a conditional statement, because when it says, if you forgive, this is, again, this would be a subjunctive mood. You more literally translate it, if you might forgive men their trespasses, meaning the conditions on you. You've got to do it. Your heavenly Father will also forgive you if you meet the conditions. If you don't meet the conditions, he's not going to forgive you. The next verse says it. But if you do forgive men, if you forgive not men their trespasses, uh, that otherwise, that you don't meet that condition. You didn't forgive. You forgive not. You, for, you didn't forgive them. Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. He's not going to do it. We see the same thing spoken over in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, after verse 24, which we talked about, the prayer of faith, comes verse 25, and it connects it together because it begins with an and, and it's talking about praying. Otherwise, you could act on verse 24, but if you don't meet the conditions of verse 25, your verse 24 prayer is going nowhere. You've got to meet the conditions. And when you stand praying, continues on, doesn't it? You always got to look at these things. Whenever you see an and, it connects what's been said. You've got to combine them together. Forgive, if you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. If you have anything against anybody, you must forgive them. Otherwise, he's not going to forgive you your trespasses. If you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Same thing. We see another thing. As we're talking about what the scriptures say are a necessity for you and I to do to have fellowship with the Father and to see him accomplish his work in your life. And remember, part of it is he wants us to be clean. We've got to have a pure heart. We've got to get cleaned up. Mark 6, 24. Matthew, I'm sorry, it's Matthew. <laughs> Didn't look right. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon, which are riches. You can't do that. That makes it an, it's an idol in your life. 
many people in America serve riches. Unfortunately, we got a lot of Christians even to serve riches. That's a mistake. No, you serve God. God will bless you and prosper the work of your hands and bring abundance to you, but you can't be serving those riches. You can't let them dictate anything about what you're going to do. Well, I'm not going to do something because of such and such, My, you know, these riches over here. Oh, no. You've got to put God first place and serve Him. Another thing, verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not much better than thee? They? God, if he feeds the birds, and he'll certainly take care of us. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? The word thought is not a good translation because it's the word merimnao, which means to be anxious or to be troubled. You don't catch that just by a thought. If you are taking anxiety and you're troubled about something, you're worried, you're full of care, concern, anxiety about something, you're going to be hindering God from accomplishing things. Why take ye merimno, which means anxiety or being worried for raiment? Consider the lilies of the filly, the field, lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, do they spin. Yet I say unto even Solomon, all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He goes on and says, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? He wants you to trust him, to meet your needs, to feed you, and to clothe you, and provide your necessities. Wherefore, therefore, he says, take no anxiety, worry, concern, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Where shall we be clothed? That's anxious. That's worry. That shuts down him from working. Remember the cares? It's the same word, Merimno. The cares of this world, the worries, anxieties will choke the word and it won't produce anything in your life. And then he goes on and says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. And then it goes to the next statement, which you must understand is kind of tying all this together. Many people just take verse 33 out of context and forget about what it's saying. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All what things? All your needs. Being fed, being clothed, all these things will be added unto you. And so why do we need to be seeking first the kingdom? Because the kingdom is the rule and the reign of God. And when you, take a, you put the rule and the reign of God into manifestation, then you are taking dominion over the enemy who will be trying to hinder or steal or kill or destroy, and you stop the works of the enemy as you rule and reign because you're a king. Remember, you're a king. You and I are kings and priests and kings unto God, and we are now to rule and reign. We're in the kingdom. So you need to seek first the kingdom, how it works, making sure that you use your authority over the enemy to stop his works so he doesn't hinder anything. And righteousness. You've got to walk in righteousness, of course, if you're going to see God respond to anything. Remember, if you're not right, righteousness, by the way, is not just talking about you being born again. It's another line teaching that's gone forth in the body of Christ saying that you're perfectly righteous when you're born again. Almost everybody teaches that out there. It's error. The reason being is because, and we ought to cover this, Let's look at two scriptures that are important. Many people take the scripture and say, this scripture declares I'm the righteousness of God. Most all of the teaching that goes forth declares that from this scripture. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, we might be made the righteous of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Well, you've got to look up everything. It says, he hath made, who's that talking about? God the Father hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, mankind, who knew no sin, speaking of Jesus, that we, mankind, might be made the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. So we come to Jesus, now we're righteous, perfectly. That's how they get it. Because we're made righteous. Well, you've already seen, we've got to look up words. Let's find out about these words. We already saw with ask and ask, they weren't the same, were they? 
They were different. First word, made. Poeo, it means make. Past tense means made. Yeah, they did right there. Second word, made. I put the cursor over it. Is it going to be poeo? Should be if it was right, but it's not. It's ginomai, which means become. Well, that's a big difference. If I've been made something, it's a done deal. If I'm going to become something, it's not done yet. It means it can come into manifestation down the road if I meet the conditions. That's what it's talking about. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we, and when we look up this, we also have to look up the tense voice and mood. It's critical. It is a present tense verb, and it's a subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood means it's a conditional statement, remember. So it says that we, the way, because it's present tense, the way you would better translate it, like Young's brings it out, that you may become the righteousness of God on an ongoing basis, because it's present tense, if you meet the conditions, because it's subjunctive mood. That's what it's saying. Well, that changes the whole deal. The Father made Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we may become the righteousness of God in Him if we meet the conditions on an ongoing basis. <laughs> Are you perfectly righteous when you're born again? No. You have a spirit that's right, but that doesn't mean it's, a, it's always made forever. When you hear people talk about righteousness, they seem to forget Maybe they don't forget. Maybe they just ignore it. But we'll be nice and say they might forget. But I think they ignore it, this verse. This is a critical verse. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. When it talks about no man deceiving you, why would the scripture say that? Every place where it says let no man deceive you, it's always about something important. And why would he say this? Because God in his foreknowledge knows the subject that it's going to be talking about People are going to be deceived about this teaching. They're not being taught correctly. Otherwise, why would he say it? There'd be no reason. Little children, let no man deceive you. Yeah, and when you see that, perk up your ears. Oops, I better check something out here. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. The word doeth, present tense. He who's doing continuously righteousness. How do I do righteousness? You do the word of righteousness. You do what the word says. It's called the word of righteousness in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13. And one who uses milk is unskillfully in the word of righteousness. So the guy who is doing righteousness continually, as it says, is righteous even as he is righteous. Well, that sure changes the picture on everything, doesn't it? This teaching that says we're perfectly righteous when we're born again and it doesn't matter what I do the rest of my life, I'm automatically righteous, is a lie from the pit of hell. It's a lie from the devil. And it's been taught almost every place. You know why? Because people haven't taken the time to study and look up the tense voice and mood and look at all these things. You have to, it's mandatory. And if you're here for the first time or you're here and say, boy, this just seems a little bit overwhelming. If we don't get taught these things, you're going to be in the dark on everything. Until I knew this, until I learned all this, I was in the dark. We have to know these things. I learned, studied all these things, you know, long, long ago, 30 years ago. This is what we had to do in order to see the truth on things. So, when it goes back to... Matthew, chapter 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So if I'm seeking His righteousness, what's that mean? I'm going to be doing His righteousness continually. Doing the word of righteousness, right? So that means I'm going to be meeting those conditions that are necessary. I'm going to be seeking first the kingdom. I'm going to be operating in the rule and reign of God, using my authority to conquer all the enemies. Because the kingdom gets manifest when you use your authority. Remember, Jesus cast out the demons by the Spirit of God. Then the kingdom of God has come unto you. 
the rule and the reign of God came in the manifestation when he uses authority. If you use your authority and stop all the works of the enemy and you're walking in righteousness consistently right with the Lord, there's nothing's going to stop the Father from meeting every need in your life. That's for sure. And that's what it's all saying. All these things shall be added unto you. Well, we've covered some things. We didn't get real far, but we did take the time to talk about New Testament prayer, which I think every, if you heard it before, you needed to hear it again. And if you haven't heard it, you needed to hear it for sure. Because if you've been praying Old Testament prayer, God's saying, we want to come in line with the truth so we can start seeing the results come to pass. So we've seen tonight we're supposed to live to the Father by doing the Word. We're going to worship Him. We're going to serve Him. We're going to make sure we have a pure and clean heart, clean, clean in heart so we see God. We're going to be a peacemaker so we're going to be the real sons of God. We're going to let our light shine through our good works so that we'll glorify the Father. We're going to walk in love. We're going to bless those that curse us, love our enemies, bless those that curse us, do good to those that do evil to us, and pray for others that spitefully use us or persecute us so that we might become the sons of the Father. And we're supposed to come to the place of being perfect. As we do this, we will be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Anything we do, we do our alms or we're fast or we pray, we never do it to be seen of men. We always do it with the right motivation, and God then will reward us openly, as He says. When we pray, we don't pray with a bunch of meaningless words just on and on and on, thinking we're going to be heard for our much prayer. You're going to go nowhere. No. But instead, we pray accurate New Testament prayer to the Father in the name of Jesus, making a demand of what's due us by bringing the Scripture promise and with thanksgiving taking hold of it and continually speaking that into being until it comes into manifestation, praying without ceasing. And regarding our authority, we command the work of His hands for the rule and the reign of God to come into manifestation as we command things into being. We command all these things to happen in our life. And if we have met the conditions before God that we truly are having a heart that's right before Him and we follow His commands and, and we walk in His word, in the Word and we do certainly have a love Him with all our heart, soul, and we're walking right, then God will not be bringing us into any kind of testing or anything because He knows we're walking right. But if you're not walking right, you will be tested. You have to be tested, actually, because if you're not walking right, is God going to respond? No. So He's going to need to test you and say, you need to get in line on these things so that you will be right so He can respond. God wants to answer the prayer, but He's not going to do it and if it's not in line with the Word of God. And we pray correctly. God will give us good things. Remember, we must forgive. And we also cannot be serving riches. We must be serving God. We can't be in worry or anxiety about anything. But instead, we're going to seek the rule and reign of God. We're going to operate in authority. And we're going to be doing righteousness. And everything that God has for us will be added unto us. And He will bring these things to pass. One last scripture I'm just going to throw in here. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, that sure destroys a lot of teaching out there, doesn't it? But who? But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Well, what happens if you're doing the will of the Father in heaven? Oh, that means you're doing the word. You're going to be righteous, won't you? You'll be right before the Lord. That is the one that's going to enter in. That makes you a righteous one. Only the righteous enter in. And you'll be seeing that in the scriptures that we'll be bringing. We've got a lot of important scriptures that we're going to be bringing up in this series on the Father that's going to really bring a lot of things that are important for you to know and to make sure you're, we're walking in so we are right before the Lord. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God regarding the revelation of the Father. And I see what the Word says I am to do so that I am right with the Father 
so that I will know the Father, so that I will have fellowship with the Father, and so that I will see him perform the promises of God in my life. I thank you. I'm going to meet the conditions and do what the Word says so that I will be right with the Father and I will see the promises coming to pass in my life. Thank you. I will be a doer of this Word. I will pray accurately New Testament prayer. And I thank you for the promises coming to pass in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We have a lot to talk about on this series, which we're going to be going through. And I believe in, at the, if you get a hold of all these things, it's going to be a key because one of the things that Jesus prayed for the Father in John 17, his high priestly ministry, was that they would be sanctified through the truth, that they would become one, that the glory that was given to him, the, they would have the same glory and be one, and they would be perfect in one. That's all supposed to happen in the body of Christ to be a part of the glorious church. And that's what he's going to produce in every one of us, is you and I are hearers and doers of the word. Father, I thank you for all you brought forth. Thank you for what you're going to do in this series of messages. We are going to take hold of it and do the word. And we are going to know the Father and develop the personal, intimate fellowship of the Father and see you accomplish everything in our life. Thank you for this great work that you are doing in each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.